Song Revolution with John Chisholm on the NRT Podcast Network. Hey everybody, John here, back with you for the Song Revolution. I'm always happy to see you here, and I just can't thank you enough for subscribing, liking, and sharing these episodes with your creative community. Whether that's your church's worship team, your worship pastor, your friends and family, and anyone who enjoys Christian music would enjoy these interviews, so thanks for helping us share the love. I like to say it's about more than songs, y'all. It's about a better life, and I really mean that. I just believe that our conversations here can impact your whole life and not just your songwriting. And the truth is, if you are a songwriter, we bring all we are to our songwriting. So having a better mindset about everything in your life is just going to affect your songwriting positively. In my NCS Pro Song Mastery program, we talk about this a lot. It's easy to think that we can write great songs in an emotional vacuum, but we really can't. You know, our creativity can be functioning at a very high level or at a very low level, depending upon our current mindset. And we have this really bad habit of clumping a whole lot of things under the generic term writer's block. But, you know, we can be blocked in a lot of areas in our lives, and that affects our songwriting. I mean, we say we have writer's block, but what that really means is that we think that we're in an unproductive season if we're not completing songs. And, you know, maybe that's true. We're not as productive as we want to be, but what it really means is that we're overloaded. We're probably stressed and depressed and just not in the flow of writing that we could be in. You know, there's really no specific thing as writer's block. It's a generic umbrella term that we use as a catch-all for a lot of other things that can be addressed in our lives. We, we can deal with things. We can get them fixed so that we can be completing songs and functioning at a very high level of creativity. I recently taught a one-hour class called Overcoming Songwriting Limitations, where I unpacked some specific strategies for dealing with what we call writer's block. And I want to offer it to you today as a gift just for listening to the show. You can access it through the link in the show notes. Just cruise down there, look for it, and click on the link to listen in to the four action points that I offer for you to work your way back into a highly creative and productive season of your songwriting. Well, here's a little hint from that teaching. No downtime is ever wasted. Even if you're feeling unproductive, even if you're not completing songs, you don't have to look at that as wasted time if you repurpose it to researching, learning, and adding skills to your songwriting. In fact, the lack of skills is the primary reason people feel blocked. They really just don't have the full songwriting process down, and they don't have the real skills or the the, uh, the skills really to power through a downturn. And that's why we exist here at NCS. We're here to empower Christian songwriters worldwide to fulfill your particular calling to worship God and lead others into a deeper sense of his presence, to share his love and to use your gifts to get your songs out there where they can do some good and make the world a better place. And that's why we offer our eight-week online coaching program called NCS Pro Song Mastery. It's a high-level coaching and mentoring experience designed to help you break through to the kind of songwriting that makes people pay attention to what God's pouring through your life instead of just getting a big yawn, a zero response to your songs. Well, I don't think there's any excuse for not excelling in our callings and Our mastery program saves you time, money, and the heartache of losing out on this passionate calling that you feel is from God. You know, I believe you are called, but it's not going to just happen on its own. You've got to cooperate with the Spirit of God to get it done. And that's why we're here. You don't want to be left out. You have a message, a ministry, a voice. So jump down to the show notes. And click the link to set up a free discovery call with us today to see if NCS Pro Song Mastery is right for you. And let's get this thing done for God's glory, all right? 
Well, my guest today is certainly getting it done for God's glory. Davy Flowers is an incredible songwriter. She's a worship leader, recording artist, and a dynamic part, a resident artist of Shane and Shane's Dallas-based worship initiative that's offering a lot of incredible worship resources for the local church these days. Uh, they produce song charts, lead sheets, four popular worship songs, a podcast, and now a label with Davey and two other great songwriters and artists that I've already interviewed here on the show, John Mark Cole and Justin Warren. Well, I had to complete the trifecta with Davey, and now I'm chasing the Shanes themselves to come on the show. So guys, if you're listening, I want to get you on really soon. Well, they're doing a great job with the Worship Initiative and raising up a new generation of worship songwriters and leaders like John Mark and Justin and Davey. I, I had had Davey booked last year when she was suddenly snatched up to be a part of the Kirk Franklin Arena Tour. So we had to reschedule. But in the meantime, I'd been getting to know her music and ministry and just fell in love with who she is and what she's up to. Like me, she has had a wide-ranging experience in the body of Christ, and she brings a mature perspective to the good, the bad, and the ugly in the church world. She shares openly about her own church hurts, but how she's overcome them to serve in the church globally with her songwriting, worship leading, and devotional writing. And you're going to hear in this episode that she and I immediately hit it off and had a very deep and meaningful conversation that was fun and funny and encouraging, and it's just worth the time for you to listen to it today. I totally think that Davey is the kind of person I would love to hang out with, and I hope she will come back on the show soon. She is a deep well and has a tremendous gift to bring to you and to the global church with her message of hope, worship, and unity as we learn to lay down our differences and our religiosity to embrace the real Jesus. You know, that seems to be a prevalent theme these days as the younger generations of worshipers are figuring out that there's so much more to worship than building a particular brand of church as an institution. Davies certainly got a broader vision of what God is up to in the world and in her own life and ministry, even though she trusts him for daily guidance and leading as she seeks to love and serve him with all she is. I, I think that should be how we all go at this thing, just following Jesus with an open heart, an open mind, and with open hands to receive all he wants to pour through us and all he wants to lead us into. So, enough preaching for now. I, I know that you're going to enjoy this insightful and fun interview as you get to hang out with me and a very talented, skilled, and beautiful young woman, songwriter, worship leader, resident artist with Shane and Shane's Worship Initiative, and now my new best friend, Davy Flowers. Davy Flowers, welcome to the Chips Pod. Thanks for having me. So I've been looking forward to this. I have to tell you, we originally booked for last year, and then you got snatched up with Kirk, somebody. Know what happened? Can't touch this. But you're like gone on tour with Kirk Franklin. How was that? <laughs> that was crazy. I mean, I think for sure it's going to go down as the most epic thing I'll ever do in my <laughs> life as far as scale. I'm just Shut like, up. I'm just like a local church girl. I just like to plug away with my people. So that yeah. was just like the grandeur of that was kind of wild. You were out doing arenas, right? What yeah, was it was an arena be? tour. Like, I mean, like Staples Center. Yeah. And like, yeah I mean, I, every major arena in every major city. Wow. And it was a big production. I've never seen a Kirk Franklin tour, but I bet it was Oh. It was it was a whole production. Mm. You and Ryan Ellis were opening up? Yeah, well, no, 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 Ryan no. and I joined House Fires. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and we, we so as a group, as House Fires, we opened for the tour together. So cool. Yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of a random thing that the Lord did, and I'm like, looking back, I'm like, I see so, so much of his purpose in it, and as a result, I have like so much more affection for the broader body of Christ mm. like spread across this country like and 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 on that tour there was just a representation of a just very diverse crew from like various backgrounds various church experiences various denominations various like at various stages of like Christian maturity and so you know I'm mm. so used to just like living and existing in my bubble with my people in my yeah, community right, right, right. so I just got to learn and grow and be so challenged from a lot of people that are just different from me I bet. That was amazing. Was I, awesome. I love what you just said about 
different levels of Christian maturity, but we'll save that for another. Uh, okay. Another I, mean, I mean that as a, it's not a negative thing. It's, oh, just, okay, a, it's, okay, just, okay. it's just a fact of life. You know, some people have been walking with Jesus for 20 years. I some people you. just just got here. Uh, you just never know. <laughs> getting off on those buses, you never know. What's you, you, you never know. You never know. Now, like I said in the intro, you are with Shane Squared mm-hmm. at the Worship Initiative. Mm-hmm. But that's a fairly new thing for you, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I guess I've been officially on the team as a resident artist for about a year and a half yeah, now. Yeah. But I'm, I'm really good friends with Shane Bernard and his wife, Beth. Like, they're mm, like some of my best mm. friends. So I've known them forever. Well, you got to put a good word in for me because I've now I've interviewed John Mark and Aaron from the Worship Initiative. Uh-huh. And now you... And I've never met the Shanes. Oh, you got to meet I mean, them. I know their work and know their their love for God and their just all their music, but I've just never had a chance. Do you, will you, like, do the I'll connection? put in a, I got you. Did you do that? All yeah. Right, cool. I, I, I've got Shane B's ear, so I, right. I got you. All right. We're coming for you, Shane B. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been getting to know you and your work over the last week or so, it's just anticipating you being here. And I am blown away with just the depth of your experience, the depth of your, just your experience in life. And as I was telling you a little, a little bit before the show today, that I really feel like we've, we've walked kind of parallel mm. experiences, you know, because like you, I grew up in a non-Christian, pretty dysfunctional home. Uh, may my folks rest in peace, but you know, it was just the truth of the existence mm. in the 60s and 70s. And came to Christ as a teen, felt an immediate call, Mm -hmm. and then wound up with this eclectic journey through the body of Christ. I kind of call myself a mutt in the body of Christ, you know? Same. Uh, So I was, I just really resonated with your experience. And and when it comes to your songwriting, it, it feels like you pull on a lot of that depth. I mean, to go from charismatic to reformed, it, you know, I almost became an Episcopal priest for Christ. Uh, okay. Yeah, the collar got a little itchy, so I didn't. <laughs> I didn't do that. So, how does this depth and this this well rounded experience of theology and and church experience inform your song? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like just in general, I've got like a couple of core values as a songwriter, and one that's pretty high up there is just authenticity. I'm like very inspired by story, you know, right. just like the story of God in creation, the story of God and the people around me, the story of God in his word and the story that God has been writing in my life since I, since I showed up on the planet, you know? Mm. And I, I know that for me, the music that most resonates with my soul, that I am most encouraged by, that I am most moved and stirred by is the music where there's just like clear vulnerability, where you feel like people are actually letting you in to their questions, letting you in to their pain, letting you in to their wrestle with God, letting you in to the pages of their journal as they mm. seek to make sense and, and reconcile the faith with like just the hard stuff of life. And so from jump and for me, I started writing even before I was a believer, I started like writing and creating. I would write little songs. I would write little poems. I would write little stories. It's always been like a safe place for me to work out the deep things of my heart. And so whenever, I, whenever I became a believer, there was just that natural transition of like, yeah, it's it's like worship orients centered around the glory of God and centered around the, the the word of God and all of that. But but writing and figuring out how to express things through like the filter of my actual story. And so mm-hmm. I just value authenticity. I value vulnerability. I, va- I value honesty. And through the years, I mean, I've gotten to have, I mean, more conversations than I can even remember with people that are like, Hey, you know, th- this aspect of your story resonates resonated with me. This this aspect of your story gave me permission to go there with God, so to speak, or to mm. let God into those deep hidden places yeah. of brokenness and pain and That's doubt so and good. So, you know, the first place to jump in here real quick, the first song that ever did that for me was David Leonard and Leslie Jordan's song mm-hmm. Brokenness Aside. Okay. Do you remember that one? Yeah, can you remember that? Yeah, sing, sing, sing me a little ditty. Will your grace run now? If I tell you this, because all I know is how to run. Because I am a sinner. If it's not one thing, it's another. Mm. Am I going to have to pay copyright of this? Probably. Caught up in words, tangled in lies. 
But you are a savior. Yes. You take brokenness yeah. aside. So good. And make it beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, that just, just, man, just opened up. I mean, gosh, 10, 15 years ago now, but, or whatever, but it just kind of felt like it opened up a whole new stream of confessional worship yeah. that we didn't Honest really worship. much do, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I'm hearing in your story. And in another podcast that I was listening to of you, you said there are two kinds of sides of your life. One is that wholehearted, you just give yourself fully to everything. Mm -hmm. But you said there's the shadow side when you're living on. So this was when you were fasting your social media. Okay. When you were getting six months off of uh -huh. Twitter Gram. You've done some and deep dive research, my friend. I know, right? But I love this because you're just so awesome and open because you said that your shadow side when you're kind of caught up in the whole social media thing that you are consumed, cons yes, consumed by it, anxious, fearful, prideful, vain, comparing. And this is the phrase I love that you said. You said you become discontented with the goodness of God in your story. Uh -huh. Oof. So I just that just brought tears to me because I know that I can do the same thing on at any given moment that I fall into that sin of comparison, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that whole confessional side, and even in the songs I've been listening to, you know, on I Was Loved, it's like, man, it just, it just takes you there, it takes you into that honest, open space. Mm -hmm. So why do you do that? Why do I do that? Why do you do that when you could just, like, sing about Jesus? and That's... But how else am I going to do it? You know, it's like he he accepted me as I was. He wanted me with all that I brought to the table. Mm -hmm. He it's all and, and it all of my like true, genuine, authentic worship is the kind of worship that encompasses all of life. It encompasses all of our hiccups. It encompasses every aspect of our story. And I've just found so much freedom in being able to worship and enjoy God and experience God and receive from God um, on the backdrop of like actually relating to him as yeah. I am, as opposed to like coming before him with a facade or with a face or with a presentation or with a, you know, cleaning myself up before I get there. Like that mm. is just like the glory of the gospel is that mm. Jesus has done a work yes. so that just as I am with mm. my all encompassing chaos and messiness and questions and brokenness, I get to enter into the presence of God, stand before the throne of God, relate to a holy God, free of shame, free of condemnation, free of pressure, you know, mm. to be anything other than I am. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, he's, he knew, I, I get so excited about the thought that, you know, it says that before, it says that he predestined us to adoption as sons like mm. before the foundation of the world. I love thinking about the fact that God being able to look down through the corridors of history and know every, he knows my full story from beginning to end, right? He knows, he knows what's, you know, the, the, the sin that's going to catch me up 10, 15 years from now, knowing it all, he decided previously <laughs> before I got here that I was just going to be his. Go figure that. And so that's like an anchor for my soul. Cause I'm mm. like, that means that my communion with God, my acceptance before God, God's delight in me is not dependent upon the rise and fall of my failure or success. It's mm. not dependent upon my merit. It's not dependent upon my performance. And so I can, I, yeah, just, I'm encouraged by the assurance that I am delighted. I am delighted by that. Oh, sorry. God delights in me as I am. Yeah. And you can just move from a place of peace and love and belonging I know this has been a big thing for your life as well, but, mm -hmm. you know, instead of the striving, instead of the works, yeah. merit-based kind of theology, mm -hmm. right? Now, you said something else that I just love. You said, uh, there's a blessing when you come to the table again and again when God disappoints you. And I think there's a, there definitely is that blessing when you just come, you know, and just fall on your face and know you're welcome there. Do you think God's disappointed you? That was a part that kind of interested me. Can God disappoint us? Yeah, I think the reality of it is, is that I am, we are finite. We are broken. We have, we don't have the ability to, to actually wrap our heads around the totality of who God is. Sure. And because of my own sin and brokenness and my finite nature, God, God himself is like, he is not disappointing. It's impossible for him to, 
disappoint, but because of my broken yeah. mind and my broken heart we and my broken emotions, I feel yeah. disappointed because, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like as much as I try, as much as I study, as much as I learn, the sovereignty of God is never going to fully make sense to me on this side of eternity. As much as I strive, the the providence of God is never going to fully make sense to me. Mm. You know, like the wisdom of God, like I don't have the capacity to fully understand the mind of God. And right. so as I'm trying to sort through and make sense of the stuff of my life, all I have is brokenness to filter it through. Mm. So that's why, like, the, the the experience of disappointment is kind of inevitable because life is really hard on this side yeah. of eternity. Yeah, and you've even mentioned disappointment in the church, disappointment in 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 the hubris of church people, yeah. right? And what does I've, hubris mean? I'm really curious. I've never hubris heard is like crap. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to make it a habit if someone says a word I don't know. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Just like, okay, I'm a broken human. Okay, and we're, I'm, I'm like, gonna, you know, we're going to make some crap here. I'm going to so, steal that. I'm going to start using word. hubris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put so, it in the song. And we've all experienced it, yeah. you know, just the, the great propensity of people to screw up. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of the frailty of our human condition. We're so I'm frail. Just, I know, right? Yeah. So, but you've experienced that in church, some disappointments. And- how have you kind of recovered from some of that for anybody who might be listening, worship leaders who've dealt with, you know, situations? Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for the fact that I have, even in the midst of, I'm trying to be concise about it, even so a similarity that a similarity that I'd have to your story is that I've gotten to be a part of so many different types of communities from like the charismatic end of the spectrum to like the far reformed end of the spectrum, different brands of, of, of broken people trying to love God rightly. Right. Mm -hmm. And trying to do church rightly. And even in the midst of just like a ton of like disappointment or like frustration within leadership or like, you know, quote church hurt my, the gift of God to me has been, even with within every community that I've been a part of, God has surrounded me with at least a few really um, faithful, kind, generous, loving, pastoral people who have like come around me and shepherded my heart yeah. through a lot of that. So mm -hmm. I, my big thing was like I never, I never felt like I had to work through or sort through any of that alone. I've always felt like deeply supported by God, deeply supported by the Holy Spirit, deeply supported by, you know, just like a core group of people who have like, one, been like a safe space for mm -hmm. me to like say things as they are, process right. through the hard, but then who are, who also would enter into that and speak truth and challenge and exhort and all the things. And so that's kind of been my saving grace is that mm -hmm. like, yeah, I have walked through a lot of just weird church stuff. People are weird. People are weird and do th weird things, including hubris. me. It's hubris. It's, hu it's, it's hubris. Hubris. Hu Hubris. Hu like Hugh Grant. Hubris. A uh, hubris. <laughs> and it's like, I'm, because I'm also hubris, however you say it. I have, I have broke people. I have disappointed people. Right. I have frustrated people. I've, I have been operating right. in levels of leadership that I did, I was not equipped to be mm -hmm. in. And, mm -hmm. and yet God's grace was sufficient in that, in that he somehow, he somehow moved through that. That's yeah. kind of like a, that's like a part of the narrative of scripture is like God not only working in spite of our brokenness, but like moving through our brokenness. Right. And so I've, right. I've, I've been on both sides of that for sure. I've always been amazed when people say, well, God, God won't come near sin or God doesn't have anything to do with, you know, people that screw up or, you know, moral failures or whatever. But God's right up in the sin. Yeah. You know, he that's where he meets us. Yeah. You know, he's a friend of sinners. But. Back to what you were just saying, because I know you were raised by a single mom. You went through a lot of stuff back then, mm -hmm. but some folks helped you as you came to Christ as a 13-year-old and felt that call. There were people that nurtured and encouraged you, and then mm -hmm. maybe through the church hurt seasons. But I wanted to ask you, who are the hidden heroes of your Oh, my gosh. I'm going to get emotional. There's, I, uh, truly, I can say there are too many to count, because God has been lavish mm -hmm. in his provision of just like family. Like I, I have deeply experienced the church being the family of God. That's mm. been my story of like the Lord filling up the, the void of what was missing in my own home through the hands and feet and hearts and, and homes and time and resources of his people. And so I guess I'll share the first one that comes to mind. It's Kempton and Karen Turner. They were my very first youth pastors. So got saved under their leadership, got discipled, had my first like journey a part of my journey of like being spiritually formed under their care and bought me a bible taught me how to read it taught me how to pray would sit with would sit with me 
in their car for hours answering my questions and helping me sort through the things of God. And by the grace of God, I'm still I'm still friends with them. And they've, you know, I know that's I, that's not everybody's story that you get to over the long haul stay connected with people like yeah, that. Yeah, but yeah. I think they were the first person, sorry, him and his wife were the first people to model for me, like with their lives, what it looks like to be a faithful, fully devoted disciple of Jesus. Mm. And they, even, you know, way back then, they loved me and cared for me in a way that was truly costly to them. It's like, it wasn't like, let's just meet for an hour during the week. It's like, hey, there's there's stuff going on in my home right now. You know, my mom is in a fight with her with her husband. Can you come get me? Can I stay the night? You know, that mm. kind of stuff. So that's the extravagance that I'm talking about that God mm. has provided and just like the love of his people. It's like people stepping in and going, hey, I'm not just gonna, I'm, not, I'm just not gonna teach you biblical truth i'm gonna show you biblical truth yeah. you know and so i'm just really yeah. blessed i'm really i'm really really blessed it's like i my to be honest my story is really hard my upbringing was really traumatic there's i could spend all day sharing the stories of the things that could have broke me broken me but the reality of it is is god has been kind to me in providing people to like really step in and come around and support and pastor and shepherd and love and disciple I mean, that is a huge part of my story. Like, I'm definitely who I am today because of the people that have got that God has brought along to, to walk alongside me along the way. And we're grateful for that. And I I share that testimony. There are people that were very influential and and I <laughs> inconvenienced them and really latched on to one particular lady who led me to Jesus when I was just 18 out of a whole lot of stuff, a lot of hubris. She just she just allowed me to to take up residence in her heart and her life and be at her house a lot. Mm. And so many of my my young seminal experiences in Christ were there with her. She's in heaven now. Hello, Lynn. And just such a deep influence and really became a spiritual mom to me in a time when I needed it. So she's my my hidden hero, That's and awesome. she's really the reason I'm here. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the investment that she made in me. And so we're thankful for your youth pastors and yeah. the first Bible they bought you because you might not be here showing up in the space in the same way that you are now. So kudos to them. Thank God you, bless them. And yet yeah. I know because I've listened to some other podcasts and been kind of reading up on you that there has always been this need for belonging and a mm -hmm. sense of maybe being good enough or measuring up or finding a space that you could relax and just be you and I'd love to write the song Chasing Home with you, but that's your title. You said that on Jenny's Jenny Allen's podcast, but what does it feel like to be you right now? Yeah, what does it feel like to be right now? To be me right now. Yeah. In this present moment. Everything else aside, you know, all other the music and the stuff, you know, because we look at you and it's like, wow, I mean, man, beautiful, drop dead, gorgeous singer. You're just amazing. You're the worship initiative. You're making records, you know, and you seem to have just found such a beautiful place. What does it really feel like? It feels like freedom. You know, it's like I've I spent so many years of my life trying to work my way into people's affections by way of mm -hmm performance and by way of putting on and presenting in a, in a way and you know that that's exhausting especially over the course of like 20 years you know I don't yeah. know if it's like I don't know if it's just like you get to a, a certain point in your relationship with the Lord in your spiritual formation and like maturity that you're like okay I actually believe the gospel now so I'm just gonna rest <laughs> I'm gonna rest in what's done and what's yeah, finished yeah, yeah. or I don't know if it's like once you get over like 33 some, something did happen something has happened in my soul entering into my 30s where just the angst just kind of like subsides because you just kind of realize I probably am who I'm going to be. <laughs> you know, it's like I could I could I could spend the rest of my life striving or I could just abide in Jesus and let him let him love me where I'm at and let me show up in the world in these spaces as I am, as opposed to playing these little games in my head, trying to man trying to manufacture something or manipulate myself to be something for some reason. So it feels it feels like rest. It feels like freedom to be you know, I'm the community that I'm a part of right now. I've never felt more seen and known and accepted for who I actually am. You know, it's like I've been a part of communities that where there's just like a lot of hype around a lot of, especially when you like are on a platform and, mm. you, you know, mm. people have a certain perception of you when you're operating in a cer certain level of leadership or whatever. And I've always kind of felt the pressure around that. But the community that I'm in now, like, it's just like 
they refuse to to allow me to even for a second believe the hype or lean into the hype. It's like they're always like, hey, what are you what are you struggling with? Like what what sin are you struggling with? What's going on in your family? Have you called your mom today? You know, it's mm-hmm. like they they see me for who I actually am. And it's just it it helps me. It has helped me allow those walls to come down and to just like show up fully as I am and and like root deeply allow my life and my identity and my sense of value and worth and validation to truly be rooted in, like I said earlier, what God, de- how God decided he was going to love me before I even got here. Mm. It's like a fixed affection. So I'm just resting in the father's affection and it's awesome. And I, I've, I've never felt more free because I'm, I'm a depraved sinner. I've still got a lot of brokenness. I'm waiting as I will mm. until I'm in my glorified body and fully alive, you know. But I, I praise God. I'm definitely, I'm abiding more deeply in what has been accomplished for me in Jesus than I have. So praise God. Yes, praise God. Yeah. Well, you just talk in beautiful lyric. Aww. It's like, I think I got 17 song ideas at what you just said. So. You can have them. Right, Chasing Home, right, all the songs. <laughs> oh, so good. It's so good, so good. I mean, you just have a poet's soul. Mm-hmm. You know, you just you just speak and 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 use. How about that for another? Another word. word. If use. If use. Like, I feel like you made that up. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when someone's effusive. Okay. You know, and bubbly okay, and okay, gregarious, okay, okay, okay. and so you just diffuse. <laughs> You just drip song ideas yeah. all the time. It just like, sounds so great. I love, love. I'm going to go back and listen to what you just said. It's so nice. So, so, yeah. And so I remember my last, my last big undoing, if you will, was a number of years back. My last big crash, I would say. You know, where life, the tectonic plates shifted, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Where I found myself just lost in late middle age it was it it was really unexpected in some ways but i was serving a large church in the midwest and one of the people that i was serving i had offended her and she said to me in the presence of the senior pastor they had called me on the carpet and she said john chisholm i hope that this church can survive your ego oh god and you know what i just nearly fell through the floor because in my own mind, I was serving. In my own mind, I was just trying to do what I thought I was hired to do. And I was kind of, you know, working so hard to engage people in worship and be a leader. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To the people. And I was so caught off guard. And I've been gone from there now, gosh, almost 10 years. And that's, that's the one thing that I think of more often than anything We had beautiful times, amazing times. I'm going to tear up. God has taught me so much through that person's harsh words. And I look back and I see that so much of, so much of my identity was in who I was on that platform. Mm -hmm. So much of my identity, I don't, I hope to the Lord that I didn't come across as an, obviously I did to her, an egotistical maniac. I, I ticked her off, so had a little to do with it but you know i i was just i was deeply shocked and i'd say offended but i think it was more shocked than anything but over the years i've i've looked back and it's like i just i didn't know who i was without being that person mm-hmm. on the platform i feel like god graciously relieved me of that position you know in that place and so how do you balance you know, the record and the touring with Kirk Franklin, all that with your own needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just like a broken record because I am so pro authentic biblical community because of the way that, I mean, it's just everything. God's, yeah, God's extravagant gift of grace for Mm. me has just been like surrounding my, linking arms and linking lives with people who are loving Jesus the way that I aspire to love him, Mm. people who are living full lives of wholehearted devotion, who are just like loving, like loving God deeply in their families and the way that they're raising their kids and the Mm. way that they're loving their, in their community, in their neighbor, you know, like I'm just, I'm surrounded by some of the best of the best. Mm. And my closest friends, it's like, they just really, they, they don't allow me they really don't as far as like 
I'm talking like high levels of accountability, like shepherding. Like wow. I'm probably like admonished weekly, you know, of just like, hey, let me challenge you. Have you considered, you know, mm-hmm. here's something I'm seeing. Yeah. You know, let me pray for you. Here's here's let me give you some biblical counsel on, wow. you know. And so that's I can't even take. Yeah, I can't even take any any credit for any level of like spiritual, mental, emotional health in my life right now, because it's like it's all. God and his people sustaining mm. me and supporting me and That's shepherding awesome. me and loving me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad I brought you back to that answer, but I think I'm probably going to have to edit my whole little confession of this. Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> of my ego. Dude, my hubris. Dude, to have an ego <laughs> is to be a human. You know what I'm saying? Right. Exactly. No. I mean, it's very humbling and continues all these years later to, you know, remind me, okay. You know, you're all up in your head about who you are and what you got, and mm-hmm. that's not what it's about. So, mm-hmm. and the older you get, the longer you live, you realize it doesn't give you anything. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give you anything except for exhaustion. I know and wow. identity issues. So, so, so true. Yeah. I think a lot of us, you know, who are on, have been on the platform or are currently on the platform, just really have to wrestle that demon down. Mm-hmm. You know, keep surrendering it to the Lord and let Him continue to heal all that stuff and. It comes down to really finding your identity in Christ and centered on him without, you know, without losing who he made you to be, right. you know, because we want you to be Davy Flowers. You know, we want Kim Walker Smith to be Kim Walker Smith. We want Matt Marr or Phil Wick. And we want, we want these people to be who they are, you, you know. And I don't think God erases our personalities mm-hmm. or the gifts that he's entrusted to us. I, I think the more... Davy, you become the more you glorify God, yeah. which means everything's been stripped away that keeps you from being fully human and fully who you're supposed to be. Do you agree with that? Do you I do. That? Can I share a little? Do I have time to share a little Come story on, on that? Because it just came that. to mind. So this is probably like my sophomore year of high school. So I've always been very outwardly expressive, very loud, very charismatic, very like let me let me speak my mind and let me you know very passionate all that. So I was on a mission trip, sophomore, junior year of high school, and a friend of mine was on that trip. And this friend of mine, by nature, is like a, a, me- a more meek, a milder, like a quiet type of person. And we were leading a VBS together. And we were like teaching, you know, I don't remember what we were teaching the kids specifically, but we were like sitting on the curb. This is like a distinct core memory. I remember every aspect of it. We're sitting on the curb and we're talking about sin. And she goes, I don't remember the full context, but she says to the kids, like, Davy's sin is pride. She said that to children. <laughs> And I remember I share that because immediately after that, I went through this whole spiral of like conflating mm. my my personality with like sin. I was just like, oh, she thinks I'm proud because I'm vocal and I'm I'm demonstrative and I'm, mm. you know, I'm like, I don't hide, you know, and it's been through and throughout the years. God has brought that to mind over and over again was like, hey, don't conflate like your God given design and the way that he built you for his glory don't conflate that with your sin nature because those are not synonymous and we have to do the work of being able to sort through like hey no this you know there are elements of my personality that god gets a lot of like i i me too i am a i reflect the image of god just like the meek mild quiet servant you know like compassionate Mm -hmm. person i i reflect god too you know and so finding that balance of like yeah, there are parts of my 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 personality that need to die because they're fleshly, they need to be crucified. But then there are parts where it's like, who percent? <laughs> but then there are parts where it's like, God made me this way for his glory. And I can just show up and be and love him in my body, mm. with my mind and mm. my story and my personality That's and my good. voice. What does conflate mean? Like put together. <laughs> like merge, marry. <laughs> It's an amalgamation. <laughs> it's a big word, Dave. John and Davy. Can you say ubiquitous? Uh, it's the conflation of the ubiquitous amalgamation. Well, that's hilarious. So, what's the one question no one's asking you right now? What's the What's the one question nobody's asking me? You got me. <laughs> uh-huh. That was it. <laughs> All right, let me ask it a different way. Okay, okay. What's the one thing about you that you wish everyone knew, but no one's ever asked you? And you don't talk. You've been pretty open. Yeah. We've talked about pride and ego and hubris and conflation. Uh, 
but what's the one thing you wish everybody knew that they did? Like a like And I'm not asking for something bad. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, was nothing bad. I mean, we're not I'm not digging for dirty laundry here, but you know, but you know what? I think I'm I think I'm more this might be like antithetical to everything I've been saying all this whole time, but <laughs> I'll just be honest. I think that I am more fragile than people mm-hmm. assume because of what I was just talking about. Mm-hmm. Because like I, I'm all the things I'd said before. Yeah. I think people assume that I'm not sensitive, that I, I, I've had people tell me that I'm like, for whatever reason, I can be intimidating, which I don't understand for the life of me because I'm just like, I'm just an utter mess behind the closed doors. You know, the people who know me know like Davies, Davies just, she's got a fragile little heart. Yeah, that's good. No, yeah, that's yeah. good. I always, whenever I go out, because I do get, I get to go, I get to lead at different conferences and events and whatnot. And you know, when people often come up to me, and you can tell a few words in the, into the conversation that they have a perception of of who I am, and you know, and they kind of relate. They're relating to me not on the basis of who I am, or even interested in relating to me on the basis of who I am, but on the basis of this idea of who of what who they think I am. Yeah, you know. Right. And so I just want people to know that, like, I'm just, I view myself as just like a messy, chaotic, broken kid of God. That's just, you know, that's kind of what the Lord's been teaching me of just like, I'm never going to grow out of being a dependent. I'm never going to grow out of my neediness. I'm never going to grow out of being a child of God. I'm just always going to be a kid. And that's kind of, I want to, I want to, I want to live there and be free to like, you know, live out of that place of like, I'm, I, I have, I need him so much. Mm. And the things you think are awesome about me are are probably not that great if you really if you really get down get down to it you know and that's where a lot of this worship comes from your dependency on Christ mm-hmm. and just this reality i don't want people up in my face admonishing me every week you <laughs> you have allowed yourself to live in a deep <laughs> a deep community where you're allowing them to help sand off the rough edges i guess all right, last question. Okay. You know, I deal with a lot of worship songwriters here at Nashville, Christian songwriters, and we do a lot of wonderful coaching and programs and all the kind of stuff you can find out at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. But what would you say, you're writing all the time, releasing music, leading worship, what would you say to, to songwriters, people that say there's nothing left to say in worship? Did you see what I did there? Oh, there's a, uh, that's one of my songs. <laughs> See, I'm not I'm not that quick with it. It takes me a second. It takes me a second. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? I mean, people people worship writers a lot say, "Well, there's just nothing left to write. Everybody's written everything there is to say." And I get it. I yeah. I have felt that. I have yeah. processed through that. I remember whenever I went to a Hillsong concert and I heard live for the first time. What's that song? Please be a thousand and a um, mm. What's that song called? Whatever. It's a Whatever. really, it's a yeah. really profound. Good. It's one of the most prolific worship songs I've ever heard. And I remember thinking, I will never write again. I can't write a song this, this, this good, mm-hmm. you know. And the reality of it is, is like the mysteries of God and the the mysteries of the gospel and the story of God and man written throughout the pages of Scripture. They're so rich and deep and complex that there's just we can, we're going to spend all of eternity singing about the same things and they're just we're we're gonna there's there's gonna be this continual discovering of depth because there's just even you know even if you're just gonna sing about the cross there's like so many different angles from which you can sing Mm -hmm. about it and it hits it hits your heart at a different in different ways at different points depending on what's going on you know it's like there's something to like the ancient truths that don't change you know and figuring out creative ways to say the same thing because it's like what's what's true has always been true and it's always going to be true so it's like it's not like we're trying to write a new story we're Mm. just trying to steward what the gifts that god has given us uniquely to be able to yeah kind of like come up with our own version or our own tone tone of that you know Um, there was another thought in my head that just left my brain yeah just that passage in job where it says that we've only we've only seen the edges in terms Mm. of the beauty of god the majesty Mm -hmm. of god the grandeur the magnitude of who he is and what he has done in creation and throughout history, even what we know of him, we've just like barely seen a glimpse. We've mm. barely heard a whisper. We've barely scratched the surface, mm. you know? And so 
There you go, dropping lyrics on us again. I mean, that's just Bible. So that is just totally Bible. No eye has seen nor ear heard. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. well, you know, there's it reminds me on Netflix. We'll put a plug in for Louis Schwartzberg. Hey, do you watch Netflix sometimes? Uh, yeah. Louis Schwartzberg, look up moving art. Okay. And there's he does these beautiful nature things, you know, beautiful, beautiful films. And he has one look up flowers okay. here. And it's time lapse photography where these flowers are unfolding, and you won't believe it. It will blow your mind. Layer after layer. You think, okay, how many times can that flower open up to some mm. different level or layer and little different stems and petals and fuzzy things? And it's just crazy. Mm. I think that, that that's my picture of God. You know, our universe is continually spinning out new stars. Yeah. Every nanosecond, there's a billion new stars, you know, happening up there somewhere. I think of God as a Louis Schwartzberg time-lapse flower mm -hmm. that for eternity, whatever that really is, we're going to be watching as God unfolds layer after layer, depth, like you said, depth after depth, just mm -hmm. unimaginable beauty and glory. So for us to say there's nothing left to say, to me, is a, is a tremendous failure of imagination. Yeah, it's a it. failure to use the God-given innate imagination that He's given us, and it means we're certainly not resourcing our souls in the Bible, in other great literature and art and music and dance and photography and whatever. And what I see in you, you're adding to the literature. You're adding so much depth. It's not your to me, Davy Flowers. You are not just falling in line with a whole bunch of also rands. You're not you're not falling into this line of modern worship. No offense, love modern worship, but you're not just spouting off more and more of your own emotions and it's not all me centered. I love so many of your lyrics. They take me deeper and so keep keep I up will. the great work. I'm... Thanks for being here, Davey. Thanks for having me. This has been great. Awesome. I feel like I could talk to you all day long. I know. Well, hey, listen. What are we doing after this? What are we eating for lunch? I hope that we can do it again. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, be... I love you. Mean it. Love you back. Mean it. Oh. That was so great, John. Hey, thanks for joining us on the show today. I hope that you'll jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Check out all the resources there to encourage you in your own songwriting. And if you like what we're doing, why not share this episode out on your socials? You can find the link in the show notes. We'll see you next time.